He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to Elemental, a podcast from RNZ. I'm Alan Blackman from the Auckland University of Technology. And I'm Alison Balance. And this is episode 58 of Elemental, which means we've arrived at phosphorus. Indeed, phosphorus, one of the two most misspelled elements on the periodic table. Indeed, my note to myself at the moment is wrongly spelt. I apologise <laughs> for that. Just for those of you out there, it's U.S., not O-U-S at the end of phosphorus. The other misspelled element in my experience is fluorine, often spelt flowering. Anyway, phosphorus comes from the Greek word phosphoros, and that means light-bearing, and that was also the old name for Venus. And does it deserve this name? Yes, indeed, and we shall talk about that later, but first... Vital statistics. As always, phosphorus is a solid, it has chemical symbol P, and its atomic number is 15, which puts it in the uh, appropriately P-block elements, uh, sort of to the right-ish top of the periodic table. And one of the great things about phosphorus is that this is the first of all the elements for which we have got an exact date of discovery. Oh, ta-da! I know, and, and I'm, I'm a bit of a history buff, I've got to admit, and I find this really interesting. So, a little history lesson here. So, there were a bunch of elements, so 12 elements, in fact, that were known prior to phosphorus. So... Trivia quiz question, those elements being copper, lead, gold, silver, iron, carbon, tin, sulfur, mercury, zinc, arsenic, and surprisingly antimony. And they were all known, as I say, prior to phosphorus, and they were all therefore discovered by people who we don't know. Discovered by unknown people at an unknown time, generally BCE. So phosphorus, we do know, was discovered in 1669 by a bloke by the name of Hennig Brandt. And it appears he was, like many at the time, an alchemist, and he was attempting to make the philosopher's stone. And this was a thing that would turn base metals into gold, and he was trying to make this from, get this, urine. So does that mean that its chemical symbol P is to do with P? <laughs> oh, By very good, chance? Alison. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I might use that. I, I like that. So what was he doing with all this urine? Well, oh boy, um, he must have loved his job. So what he, what he found was that when he boiled down urine to give a solid sort of residue paste sort of stuff. As you do. <laughs> as you do, yes. And then he heated the residue strongly. What happened is that he got a vapour which cooled to give a waxy white solid that glowed in the dark without giving off heat. And that's where it got its name from. Now, rather disturbingly, he actually used five and a half thousand litres of what, urine. He boiled what, what? down... <laughs> Five and a half thousand litres. Yep. Did he Five go around asking thousand. all his friends, could you please pee oh, in this jar for boy, me? Oh, boy, oh, <laughs> boy. Um, yeah, and the thing was it had to be well-aged as well, apparently, or so he thought, so it was probably a little bit smelly down oh, wherever he was doing yeah, this. Yeah. But as the end result of all this, he got around about 120 grams of phosphorus. So he found that this was quite unusual stuff. As I said, it's a sort of a white, waxy solid. And probably one of the first things he found about this was that he had to keep it under water because if he left it out in the air, it would um, spontaneously burst into flame. So this guy, who, about whom we know actually very little, probably deserves, you know, a, a big name, I think, in chemistry, because one could argue that he was either the first true chemist or perhaps the last alchemist. Did he even know he'd discovered a chemical element? No, not until about a century later was it realised that um, phosphorus was an element, and that was uh, the great Lavoisier in uh, 1777. What Brand had created from the urine was, in fact, white phosphorus. Now, elemental phosphorus also exists in allotropic forms. We talked about allotropes in the oxygen episode. So in addition to what we call white phosphorus, you can also get red phosphorus and black phosphorus. 
and they are certainly nowhere near as reactive as the white form. You can happily leave those out in air and they won't sort of spontaneously inflame. So I think we can assume from the fact that you can get phosphorus from urine, and I'm very glad that our urine isn't normally spontaneously combusting, (laughs) it does mean we've got it in the body, doesn't it? Yes, I think that's a fair enough assumption. And indeed, around about 1% of our body weight, in fact, is phosphorus, and it's mostly found in bones as calcium phosphate. Having said that, probably its most important function, I would argue, is the fact that it is present in both DNA and RNA molecules, and uh, not surprisingly, phosphorus is an essential element for humans. And that's kind of interesting, because the free element phosphorus, white phosphorus, is very, very, very toxic, and a dose of 60 milligrams of that has been found to be fatal in the past. So how do we get away with it in our body then? That's the really interesting thing. It's not elemental phosphorus in our body, it's phosphorus in the plus 5 oxidation state. We've, we've talked about oxidation states in previous episodes, and if you take 5 electrons away from elemental phosphorus, uh, it's pretty safe. Right. I do seem to remember, just going back to the spontaneous combustion thing, which I'm quite fascinated by, its flammability played a role in early matches, didn't it? Yeah, indeed. Friction matches were invented in 1816, and around about by the 1830s, uh, these were being made with white phosphorus. And uh, the early best-selling brand of matches were called Lucifer, which was Latin for light bearer, and that's kind of the same thing as phosphorus means in Greek. (laughs) Obviously, because these things were so reactive, they were banned in the early 1900s as they were very, very dangerous. And if you just sort of jostled a box of these matches, you could get them all bursting into flame. Oh, that'd be pretty nasty if it was in your pocket at the time. (laughs) Not the best. And another thing about the white phosphorus in matches were the poor workers who had to work in match factories making these things. So this was the 19th century, and of course, uh, everyone was blissfully unaware of the fact that white phosphorus was horribly, horribly toxic, and many workers in match factories ended up succumbing to a thing called fossy jaw. This was caused by exposure to the phosphorus vapour, they were always inhaling it, and this was a horrible, horrible affliction, and it actually led to the jawbone being slowly eaten away. You, you can see photos of this on the web, and it's not pleasant. Well, I'm glad we eventually realised that white phosphorus was the problem and stopped using it then, but... What makes modern matches ignite, then, if we're not using white phosphorus? Yeah, we're using another sort of phosphorus. Somebody thankfully realised that white phosphorus wasn't particularly safe in sort of the mid-1800s, and so they invented safety matches. And the major innovation in this was replacing white phosphorus with red phosphorus, not on the head of the match, but instead on a specially designed striking surface. And the safety matches ignite due to the extreme reactivity of the phosphorus with a thing called potassium chlorate in the match head. Ah, so that's why you have to strike your match against the black bit on the side of the matchbox. Oh, I get uh, you. Yeah. Hey, here's a small match digression. Did you know that the hobby of collecting match-related items, so, you know, those little matchbox that you get and matchboxes and matchbox labels and things, it's known as philumony. <laughs> from the Greek phil, you know, phyllis mm-hmm. for loving, and the Latin yep. lumen for light. Okay. I, no, I did not know that, Alison. That's, I've learned something today. There's names <laughs> for everything. Okay, back to phosphorus. <laughs> okay, so we've already said that if you leave white phosphorus out in air, it's going to spontaneously ignite. And, of course, this got the military interested, unfortunately, and what this meant was that phosphorus was widely used in incendiary bombs during World War II, We talked about magnesium in that episode, the fact that it was very, very difficult to extinguish once it started burning, and phosphorus is very similar to that as well. And so phosphorus incendiary bombs were used extensively in the bombing of Hamburg, which led to much of the city being destroyed and 42,000 deaths, unfortunately. Very unpleasant deaths by the sound of it too. Yes, yes. Again, it can only be put out with sand. You can't put it out with water or anything like that. So on a slightly lighter note, so New Zealand is an agricultural nation and I think pretty much all of us realise that uh, phosphates are very, very important fertilisers. So, for example, superphosphate. Because of this, uh, our little island neighbour to the north, uh, Nauru, in the early 1970s, had the highest GDP per capita in the world, which I find astonishing, due to the fact that it was basically made of phosphate. And unfortunately, these today are mostly gone, and New Zealand gets its phosphate from Western Sahara now. Ah, now... We've sort of mentioned in passing getting 
phosphorus from pee, from urine. We used to get it from poo as well, just to really lower the tone of the podcast. Oh, goodness. Because there was the great guano boom of the late 1800s, you know, mostly in South America where there was widespread mining of phosphate-rich bird shit in places like Peru. Apparently the guano comes from the Quechua word meaning any form of dung that you can use as a fertiliser. And that stuff that they mined in Peru was mostly from guane cormorants. Yeah. And it had been important in fertilising the crops in South America as far back as the Inca Empire. And listeners, you can't say you don't learn anything on these podcasts, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> and before that, the major source of phosphorus was, in fact, from bone ash. So, again, as I said before, we've got phosphate in our bones or phosphorus in our bones. And so simply burning bones can give you phosphate. Now, phosphates are all well and good, but sadly the phosphates from fertilisers often wash into waterways and they encourage algal blooms of toxic algae, which we certainly don't want. And the previous parliamentary commissioner for the environment, Dr Jan Wright, wrote in her water quality report in 2012 that in New Zealand waterways, quote, the largest source of phosphorus is the sediment from ongoing erosion, a legacy of forest clearance and top dressing, unquote. Ah, so some of it's from superphosphate, but some of it's just washing down out of the hills. Yeah, indeed, yes. Oh, interesting. Yep. Staying with agriculture and uh, horticulture, so phosphates are are good, they make things grow. Organophosphates, uh, on the other hand, not quite so good, and in fact they find extensive use as weed killers. Ah, so they kill stuff. (laughs) They do, and one of those is glyphosate, which we know better as Roundup, and that's extremely topical uh, right now because people in the US are being given literally billions of dollars in court cases saying that this has caused cancer. Yeah, the jury's still out on that, so to speak. And organophosphates are also used in nerve agents, and these are particularly nasty things, so things like tabon and sarin, uh, they're very, very highly toxic. Thinking back to your comment at the beginning about white phosphorus glowing, chemically, what's going on there? Uh, Well, um, this one took a few, (laughs) actually 100 years to figure out. So the glow was first discovered by good old uh, Hennig Brunt in 1669, and in 1974 uh, they finally came up with the explanation of what's going on here. God, your chemists are slow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what does happen? So what happens is that the phosphorus reacts with oxygen on the surface of the phosphorus, and the products of that reaction are very, very short-lived molecules HPO and P2O2. And it's these guys that, in fact, emit the visible light. It's not the phosphorus itself. Now, it's a very, very slow reaction, and so you only get very, very small amounts of the intermediates, but that's all that you need to produce the luminescence. And that's the reason why this stuff keeps on glowing in a stoppered jar, just because it's so slow. Uh And you might perhaps recognise the word phosphorescence, and that comes, I guess, from the original name phosphorus. So is that the glow we're seeing? No. Ah. <laughs> no, so strictly speaking, the glow from phosphorus isn't phosphorescence per se. It's in fact chemiluminescence. And so chemiluminescence is the glow that you get due to what we call a cold chemical reaction. So phosphorescence is something like, you know, what you get with uh, glow in the dark stickers, clock dials, those sorts of things. And what happens there is a substance absorbs energy and then that energy is released from that same substance relatively slowly in the form of light. And, uh, of course, this is totally different from fluorescence and we talked about that with the element fluorine way back in episode 27. And different again from bioluminescence. (laughs) God, there's a lot of essences, aren't there? So bioluminescence is obviously what glowworms and fireflies do. Yep. And we're not actually covering those in this series, although we do cover a great many things chemical in great detail. (laughs) This was episode 58 of Elemental, and if you'd like to know more, you can find us at rnz.co.nz. We are available for free in all the usual podcast places. And we're back next time with Platinum. But until then, it's goodbye from me, Alan Blackman. And me, Alison Balance. Kia pai tora. 